It's always been a hate issue. It's never, it, it, this, it, yeah, it's never been a hate issue, it, or it's always been a hate issue, that's what I mean. This country has xenophobia hardwired into our brain. Uh, one of my all-time favorite questions in the column, and one that I usually read, somebody asks, you know, why don't Mexicans have enough gratitude to, for Americans to learn to speak English? Are they too stupid or lazy? Can't they learn three words a day? Is this asking too much? And so, my response was this. I'm like, you know what? The United States government shares your concerns. They came out with a study, multi-volume study that concludes that these new immigrants, they're just idiots. They come to this country just to make money, send it back. They're not assimilating. They're having too many kids. They're just destroying our culture. We need to clamp down on immigration, and we need to send those immigrants back home to where they came from. That's what people are saying about Mexicans now. The problem, though, is that report is called the Dillingham Commission Report, and that report appeared in 1911. And those immigrants, those idiot immigrants that they were, oh, and, and I forgot to say, the report also concluded that these new immigrants are no longer, they're not like the immigrants of the past who did all, everything the right way. The Dillingham Commission was specifically criticizing Eastern and Southern Europeans, and even more specifically calling out, oh gosh, Hungarians, Italians, Greeks, Czechs, Slovaks, uh, Poles, uh, Serbs, Croats, all of those, you know, all those immigrants from the north, uh, from the eastern and southern, uh, Russians, of course, southern part of Italy. The, and by the way, all those immigrants, those are the immigrants that we today lionize. They're the ones who came through Ellis Island, and they were grateful for America, and they immediately became Americans. No, 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 that is absolute, uh, that's an absolute lie. And, but that's always been the American way. We always love to castigate the present-day immigrant while we lionize the immigrants of the past, and it's something that you can trace through the history of America. You can even go back, I think it's the 1770s or 1760s, but before even the foundation, of, or before America's independence from Britain, you had Benjamin Franklin railing against Germans in the Pennsylvania Valley. He didn't even bother calling them Krauts. He, he used to have some other arcane ethnic slur, but said, these Germans, they're destroying America within a generation, we're all gonna speak German. And what, what happens every single generation, those, those so-called idiot immigrants, sure, they go to their ethnic enclaves. That's just the immigrant way. You want to live among people who share your same values, your same culture. But then within one generation, those children, they no longer have that tie, that very strong tie to the mother culture. The second generation has even less of a tie. Then you start moving away from those ethnic enclaves. Then you start uh, undergoing... Uh, process that sociologists call symbolic ethnicity, where you choose what parts of your ethnic identity you want to keep, but ultimately you're American. So it's like, you know, if you're of Italian-American descent and you celebrate the feast of St. Gennaro, or, or, you know, if you're Irish, you just celebrate St. Patrick's Day, but that's the only part of your Irish heritage that you have, that's what happens. But all along the way, there's always been hatred of immigrants. Whether, you know, the, I, I think the bigger lie is when people say, we're for legal immigration, but we're against illegal immigration, and it's nothing against the immigrants. No, 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 that's a lie, because if you get down to almost any argument about legal immigration, almost any argument, I'm always more than willing to have the argument, but almost always it boils down to a cultural argument, and when it comes down to a cultural argument, it's an invalid argument. It's an, it's an invalid argument and absolutely foolish and has been, been disproven time and time again. So hey, it's always been there, whether you're legal or illegal, whether you're Mexican or Irish or anything. You already touched upon English only very briefly. Here's a more specific question. We keep having to fight the English only or English as the official language in this land of the five civilized tribes, Oklahoma. Any comments? Uh, anybody who tries to legislate language, uh, they're as deluded at now, but it's delusional. It's, it's absolutely delusional. When we try to box in language, okay, you can pass English as the only language of the state, you know, as the official language of the state of Oklahoma, is that going to stop people from speaking Spanish? No. Uh, ethnic, ethnic languages have been in this country since the foundation of this country. And by the way, you know, those same ethnics who you think are not speaking any English whatsoever, they're speaking English. Those, those immigrants who you think they're not trying to learn any, any English, they're going to English language schools at night when you're not seeing them. And those kids, those kids, they're, they're, not only are they learning English, but they're preferring English over Spanish. Um, again, my family. My parents mostly speak Spanish. 
when all of us entered kindergarten, all my cousins, all my friends, when we all entered kindergarten, all we spoke was Spanish. But by the second and third grade, speaking both languages, and by the fourth grade, that's all we were, that's what we preferred in English. And our own parents are saying, you gotta keep speaking Spanish. They're not saying, don't speak English, only speak Spanish. They're saying, keep up your Spanish, keep it. But us kids, we didn't pay attention at all. So, and I also find it uh, telling of any, any civic body that tries to pass these English only laws, it, it shows not only a sense of insecurity about them, but I also think it's a sad commentary on how they feel about uh, America in general. They, they really have, they, those people who pass those English lo only laws, they don't believe in America anymore. They don't believe in what this country has been, which has always been a multilingual society, which has always seen its immigrants go through the way, you know, go up, up the ranks and become Americans. That, to me, that shows you really don't believe in America. And not only that, you really think that these immigrants are not going to become Americans, and you don't even consider them to be Americans. And I think that I think that's more of a sad commentary on them than it is about the immigrants themselves who aren't, you know, who supposedly aren't speaking English and don't want to speak English. We've, you know, we've had ethnic enclaves in this country since the beginning of the foundation of this country, and guess what? They're never going to disappear. There's been Chinatowns that almost 200 years old. Why? Because Chinese is still a vibrant part of that culture. But those Chinese, they're also speaking English too. Yeah, the world prepares itself for the world of the United States. Prepares itself for the United States. Exactly. Anyway, uh, on a more personal note, do you ever travel to uh, Zacatecas? Jerez, Zacatecas, you said? Uh, Jerez. Jerez. Absolutely. Uh, we used to travel all the time, once a year, every year, for, uh, well, uh, two times. Two times a year. December, of course, Christmas, holiday, and then during Easter week, because we're famous for something called Las Ferias de Abril. Uh, uh, Jerez, Jerez is where my parents are from. In English, it translates as Sherry. We're named after the uh, city Jerez de la Frontera, where Sherry wine is, is created from. So Jerez is famous in Mexico for many reasons. Uh, but no, but one of the, we have a big celebration. It's, it's called you know, the April Fairs. It's done during Holy Week. And it always ends with the burning of, the, of an effigy of Judas Iscariot. And so everyone from, a lot of people from uh, uh, Zacatecanos, Jerezanos in the United States, we go back to Mexico to celebrate that, to uh, you know, have a lot of fun, eat a lot, and all that. So I haven't been to Zacatecas though since 2001 because I'm a reporter and whenever you take a vacation, you know, it cuts into your days. And then the other thing, the sad commentary right now actually, my parents haven't gone back to Zacatecas in three years because of wars, they've spread there. We never had any problem with narcos. We never, that was always a problem more like Tijuana, uh, Sinaloa, of course, uh, uh, Monterrey, to a certain extent, Ciudad Juarez for sure. But then about three years ago, the cartels, they started spilling into Zacatecas. Zacatecas is in central Mexico. Now they're muzzling in to, uh, uh, Jerez is about a city about, it's a city slash county, in, in Spanish we call them municipios, and my parents, they pertain to two small little villages, so now you have narcos there in the villages targeting the people who come back from the United States because they know they have money. There's been kidnap, there's been extortion attempts, there's been kidnappings. We're petrified to go there right now, and it's sad. It is so sad because the, the people who live, those people who are terrorizing us right there, no son de Zacatecas. They're not people from Zacatecas. They're not the native sons and daughters of there. They're people from outside. But the Mexican government, I mean, they're, they don't think Zacatecas right now is, uh, is a necessary battlefield because they're right there on the front line. So I want to go back. It's beautiful. Pero, and not only, and then, and then, sorry, before you interrupt. And then the other thing, in some ways, there is no reason to go back to uh, my parents' villages because there's no one, there's no one there anymore. My mom comes from a village called El Cargadero, which pertains to Jerez. At its height, it had about 700 people living in El Cargadero. Nowadays, in Anaheim alone, there's more than 2,000 people who can trace their heritage, whether from their third or fourth generation. And in El Cargadero now, there's only 300 people left. Everyone is up here in the United States, everybody. I grew, I, I tell people, I grew up in El Cargadero in the United States, because my parents and their generation they transplanted rancho life into the United States. So every weekend, we're going to our bolvas, y quinceañeras, and carne asada Sundays, and we had the tamborazo following us all around. Uh, it, 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 you know, most of my friends, they married 
people from El Rancho. In other words, I'm one of the few people, I'm one of the few people who never dated within the rancho because none of the girls liked me. Because I was too Americanized apparently and I was too much of a nerd. And but everyone else, all my cousins, all my friends from the ranchos, they all intermarried. So that's how they, you know, in some ways, in that sense, there's no reason to visit where we're from because it's all here now. They're becoming more ghost towns, in a way. They're becoming more what? Ghost towns? Yeah, yeah, ghost towns. They're ghost towns. They're absolute ghost towns, and it's sad. It's absolutely sad, but what else, you know, what else are we to do? We need, a, we need to make an economy. The economy in our part of uh, Zacatecas has been devastated for decades due to droughts, kind of like the Okies. Droughts and, you know, loss of crops and all that, there's nothing there for us anymore. We had to come up and now we, we reconstituted our lives here in the United States and we mostly have now nostalgia for what we left behind. But we know that we're never going to leave anywhere. So, uh, one more then, I'll give it to you. Uh, so your family knows you're a writer. They know about the column. What do they think? My parents, they like the column. My mom, she doesn't like it when I answer questions about sex because what Mexican mom wants her child to talk about sex? <laughs> or what mom in general, I guess. Um, so no. But, and then she also, she also warns me. My parents, you know, they're very protective of me. Um, or or they're, not only that, but they worry a lot about me. And my mom, she says, be careful what you write in the column because people don't like it when you write the truth and you always want to write the, and you, you know, you mean like, you know, you always write the truth. You, what, for better or for worse, you always write the truth and people get mad at that, so be careful. And then my dad, the only criticism he ever had of the call, one time, uh, me, me dijo, usas muchas malas palabras, you use a lot of bad words. But before I could make an excuse, he's like, pero sabes que? Así hablamos los, los hombres mexicanos. You know, that's how us Mexican men talk, so keep using those bad words. Keep using those bad words. That's what my dad said. You don't have to agree with it, but that's what my dad said. Um, <laughs> And so that's what happened. Or maybe it's the people from my rancho. Who knows? You had a comment there. Yes, there's a saying in Spanish. Mexico, tan, tan lejos de Dios y tan cerca de Estados Unidos. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to know uh, if you think by, there's a projection that by 2050 or so that uh, Latinos in the United States will factor the numerical majority, perhaps. And if that will change the situation such that the juxtaposition of the relationship politically, economically with Mexico will in fact improve, perhaps strengthen. What do you see for Mexico politically as far as their infrastructure, as far as their cartel situation, uh, perhaps digressing, going away, things of that nature? Sure. Uh, the, the, thank you for your question. The, the lady uh, quoted probably one of the most famous quotes ever about Mexico. In English, of course, is poor Mexico so far from God, so close to the United States. Everyone attributes it to, to Porfirio Diaz, the president of Mexico. He never said it. It's, it's, it's an American imagination of what Mexicans are supposed to feel. It, uh, seriously, there's no, no one can ever positively attribute that quotation to him. Um, and then she talked about demographics in the United States. I think the demographic is that by 2050, I don't think uh, Latinos are going to be the majority, but something like maybe 25% of the population or a much, much more significant group. So what does that pertain to the future of the United States, especially in vis-a-vis in, uh, -vis relations with Mexico? It, you know, I, I think they'll, they'll be somewhat improved uh, in, in the sense that if you have more politicians who come from a background, from that you know Mexican background, immigrant background, they'll understand more the situation in going on in Mexico right now than say some senator in Maine who has no, you know, I'm just using Maine because that's so far away, that really has no clue whatsoever about what's going on on the border or with e economics. What's going on right now though in Mexico, Mexico got saved by the Mexicans up here in the United States. Um, and, and this is what I mean. And I'm sure you guys, I'm sure you guys have it in Tulsa, and if not, it's coming your way. This is a good thing. Um, what happened was, historically, whenever you had Mexican migration to the United States, the Mexican government called those migrants traitors. You know, traitors, you're leaving the patria, you know, never come back, just hated them. Those, you know, those migrants, they were leaving because, you know, the Mexican government didn't really care much about uh, advancing Mexican society, especially in the rural, in the rural areas like where my parents are from. So those migrants, they came back up, they came here to the United States, uh, set up their lives, set up their jobs, and, and, the, and the like. 
Those same migrants, though, they didn't forget about their paisanos back home. So what they started to do, and I, you know, and, and I use the example of Zacatecas because we're legendary for it in, in anthropology and sociology circles. These migrants that all came from their little villages or little towns, they set up what's called hometown benefit associations. In other words, what, what the way we did it, again, I don't know how it happens here, but the way we did it, we would have dances. We'd have the banda sinaloense, the tamborazo, uh, food, bailes, all that. You know, pay, you know, uh, you know uh, get uh, funds or, you know, fundraise that way. And then we'd send that money back down to Mexico to build houses, to build roads, to bring in electricity, to do the simple things that the Mexican government did not want to do. The Mexican government finally became wise to that situation. So now, it, it started in Zacatecas, and now it's across most of Mexico. It got, uh, what got instituted is something called the three for one program, tres por uno. In other words, for every dollar that Mexican migrants sent back to Mexico, the Mexican government would match it on a federal, local, and state level. I know a lot of people think, oh, you know, there's, a, you know, there's an invasion of Mexicans, or no, not even so much that, that Mexicans, they're strip miners, they make all this money back, all this money, and they don't even invest it in the United States, they send it back to Mexico. Well, all that investment going back to Mexico, that actually kept more Mexicans from leaving Mexico, and they it kept them there. So in that sense, and, and not only that, what that also did, it showed it showed those Mexicans who both on both sides of the border that we don't have to accept the bull that the PRI, the party that was in power for all those years, we don't have to accept their bull, we could do it on our own. So in 2000, of course, the PRI got voted out of office, you know, BAN I don't think is the best political party, but at least there was a change. So in that, and so when you start having more Mexicans up here, you know, making lives better for themselves in the United States, you also better Mexico, and by bettering Mexico, ultimately, you make, you know, you lessen some of those economic impacts that migration to the United States might, may have. So I'm positive. I, I, and then still, though, it's still, it's still the United States. Ultimately, the United States is the United States. We will keep, we will keep our character one way or another, whether it's 99% Mexicano or not. We're always going to be the United States. I, Maybe I'm an idealist, maybe I believe too much in this country, but I truly do believe it. Oh, question right. Um, I don't know if you know the answer to it. When and how did Cristobal Colón become first of Columbus and who did somehow change it? When did Cristobal Colón become Christopher Columbus and can we change it? Well, you, blame, you have to blame the English for that. You, you, you can't blame Americans or all that because the English, they did not, they did not want to use uh, foreign languages, unless it's French. French is perfectly fine. But again, going back to that divide between Hispanic and English, I mean, you even have it in, in the quote unquote new world, Cortes with, from an S into a Z. Like, that's how I always thought, you know, the great, the conqueror of Mexico, that's how I always thought Cortes was spelled C-O-R-T-E-Z. Actually, it's C-O-R-T-E-S, and then there's an accent on the E. Why did we lose the accent? We, you know, sm S Spanish has so many diacriticals, you know, so many of those accents and squiggly marks. <laughs> we lost almost all of them. It's because, and, and it, here you could blame American English, it's because for whatever reason, we just don't like the Spanish. I love American English. It's one of the great, I do think it's one of the greatest languages on earth just because we absorb so many words from so many other languages but we don't like to accept accents.